Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Kindly keep your video off and your mics on uh, mute. And uh, today's, so we are beginning a series of uh, lectures on women's movement methodological aspects. It will be on, uh, it will not be uh, any chronological history of women's movement in India. Instead, it would be try, it, we would try and analyze those struggles from different perspectives. Please, please remain on mute. Everyone, please remain on mute. So today, what we what we are going to do is not uh, present a chronological history of women's movement. Instead, it would be we would try and analyze those struggles from different perspectives, throwing light on methodological insights, and we have a very uh, well-known speaker with us who has a unique combination of academics and activism. And she has uh, won laurels on both the fronts and she has won best of fellowships and has worked in all kinds of difficult circumstances at the grassroots. So WSDC is proud to welcome Professor Indu Agnihotri. Professor Indu Agnihotri taught history in Vivekanand College of Delhi University for over two, two decades and has completed her had completed her higher studies in history in JNU. And uh, many of you may be knowing CWDS. She retired as director of CWDS, which is New Delhi. And that she had joined after, as a full-time researcher, after quitting her teaching job at Delhi University. She has been actively involved with research, teaching, development of women's studies in India, and also in women's movement since early 80s. Her research interests span the fields of women's studies, labor and migration, history of women's movement in India, from colonial times to the contemporary and women's rights, in addition to her training and research in economic history. She has been actively involved with activities of Indian Association of Women's Studies and was its general secretary from 2011 to 2014. She has numerous research papers to her uh, and many other publications to her name. Today, she would be beginning with the sub-theme, Confronting Colonialism, Women Speak of Rights in Pre-Independence India. I would request all the participants to kindly keep your mic on mute and your video on off. And uh, if you have questions, maybe you can write in the chat box. Given the time constraint, whatever we are able to pick up the good questions, we will be able to pick up and, and do the discussion hour. Professor Indu Ahudnyotri would like to present at least for 45 minutes. Am I right, Indu? Yeah. Yeah, 45 minutes, maybe a little more. And then we will take up the questions which you have written in the chat box. And uh, right here, I would also like to make an announcement because many of you might leave a little early. Uh, the last lecture, which was earlier slated at 9th October, is actually pre postponed to 6th October. Kindly note it down. The last lecture is on 6th October and not 9th. So because of technical reasons, we could have not gone up till 9th October. So today, uh, we, we, I welcome Professor Indu Agnihotri on, on behalf of everyone, of everyone here present. And uh, we begin the first lecture of the series. Welcome, Professor Indu Agnihotri. Uh, thank you, Manjit. Firstly, let me just check. Can you hear clearly? Am I audible? Yes, I can. That means others also can. Okay. Because they are on mute, uh, they will not be able to speak, okay. maybe. Okay. Thank you, Manjit, and thank you, Delhi University, for providing me this opportunity. Even though the original idea that I had, uh, uh, we had discussed was different, but we will try to do it in this mode. As Manjit said, these lectures are do not aim to provide a long historical narrative. It, and even if we tried it, the women's movement in India is so vast that it would not be possible to uh, uh, convey and uh, uh, travel that whole ground even in four lectures. And I alone would not be able to do it. There have been many participants, there have been many perspectives. Uh, though I try to capture other perspectives when I speak. Why do I speak, to, uh, speak of the colonial period? I think uh, 
But there are two, three reasons why I begin with the colonial period. One is, of course, because I'm a student of history and I do delve into history for uh, an understanding of any of the debates that I uh, confront in my uh, studies and in my practice. But I think uh, it is important to understand the women's movement, even in present times, an understanding and knowledge of the uh, colonial period is important. It is important also to understand Indian society today. So what I'm saying is both in terms of understanding Indian society and the women's movement in India, it is important to examine the historical period. And here also, it's a very large period. I, when I speak on the women's movement, I always make a distinction between women's resistance, which has a very, very long history, as, as long as history uh, of India. But the women's movement, I mean, in terms of organized activity for change and for women's rights, he, there is a difference between resistance and the women's movement. And when we speak of the movement in this context, I speak about the first half of the 20th century. Uh, although some organizations did come up towards the end of the 19th century, and there was a lot of activity in the 19th century is one of the richest periods in terms of ideas around women, women's articulation, women's roles, etc. So it's embedded in the whole uh, debate around um, the social reform in the 19th century, as well as the whole concept of the Renaissance in the 19th century and in the context of India. But our concern here is with the early 20th century. And I will here talk about why. What I'm saying is that we need to understand that imperialism and the policies that colonial India saw had a direct impact on women's lives. So the uh, articulation and the confrontation uh, in terms of rights emerged from this long experience under colonialism. It is important to understand that because otherwise somehow many of our students also seem to share this misconception that the movement and the women's movement in India arises out of some kind of ideas that are swept ashore uh, from other locations. Uh, those who oppose the movement and seek to undermine it directly attack it in terms of its so-called Western origins, etc. But I think to understand the women's movement, it is absolutely imperative that we understand its embeddedness within the experience of women in India. And it is from there that the uh, aspirations, inspirations, articulation of ideas, of demands, of issues, of modes of organization, modes of expression, all these arise from within this experience. And in this particular case, we are talking about a very long history of colonial rule which directly impacted women's lives. Along with this statement, I would like to make another statement to also correct another misconception. You know, there is another mis misconception in the minds of people that imperialism and that the colonial government actually didn't meddle around much with women because, you know, women lived in the private domain and therefore they continued to lead their lives. The British did not want to interfere and intervene too much in that aspect. What I'm seeing is as a student of history and as a student who has looked at and been involved with the women's movement for over four decades, almost five decades now, since before the emergency, I would say in 1975. What do we see that after all it is women, you know, when there is a colonial government and the mass of women in India were in rural India, they were in agriculture. There was of course an emerging middle class. There was an elite section. There were the landlords, uh, land owning classes as well as the urban uh, business classes. But the mass of women were in agriculture. They were part of the peasantry. And they were part of the urban working classes which emerged uh, with uh, the early industrialization that uh, colonial India saw. 
Now, what I'm saying is to think that colonialism allowed these women the luxury to lead their lives uninterfered, unimpacted, unaffected is a total misconception. In fact, be it their social life, be it the uh, context within which this social life was being lived, the, be it the terms in terms of the daily organization of the peasant's life, his the pressure on the peasantry, the uh, on agriculture at every level, uh, Indian society saw huge changes and a huge oppressive exploitative system in place during British India. And women were equally impacted by this. And that is why you will find that whenever movements took place, whenever movements took place of any section of Indian society, women were always there. They were very much there in the peasant masses and in, in the peasant movements and revolts. They were there in the urban working class uh, movements, strikes, etc. And there is enough evidence. You know, the other part that we hear is that there is no archival material. In fact, I can tell you, I have spent a large part of my life as a student of history delving into archival records. I can tell you, even if I led five more such lives, I would still not be able to dig deep enough into the national archives. I'm not even talking about the state archives or other forms of archives that we today discuss in terms of methodologies in history. So that is the background in which I'm talking about. When, uh, secondly, uh, the other aspect that we see is along with the 19th century social reform movement, by the end of the 19th century and early 20th century, we also find a form of visible articulation in the form of magazines, journals, uh, publications, writing by women themselves. So this also leads to, it creates both a literate audience, a readership, and it um, uh, uh, puts ideas in the public domain which are debated and there are different sets of ideas everyone doesn't agree on everything so that rich debate is very much there in all the language presses also it is there to a large extent in english but in the case of women we have to understand that the language press be it in bangla be it in malayalam be it in hindi the north indian belt uh, marathi um, Telugu, Tamil, in all the languages you will find there was a vibrant uh, debate going on. Uh, then we come to the <coughs> forms of uh, articulation, as I say, in more organized. <laughs> so, uh, apart from the Arya Mahila Samaj and some of the community based women's organizations like the Gujarat Stream uh, Mandal, these are community as well as regional or you know look, uh, geographically located there was the parsi uh, zoroastrian uh, women's uh, uh, organization some of these existed from like 1880s 90s onwards but it is in the 20th century that we find attempts are made to organize on a kind of pan indian basis some kind of uh, 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 labeled organized uh, uh, mode of activity begins. We first see the Bharat Sri Mahamandal, but after initial attempts for the first four or five years, somehow it does not pick up, even though it does have uh, several chapters in Sarla Devi Chaudhani, uh, who is the niece of uh, Rabindranath Tagore, is very active in it. Uh, she's leading the organization, but it sort of runs aground after a while. And it is from that period onwards that we see fresh attempts. There is also the Prayag Mahila Samiti, uh, which plays a, a leading role. It brings out a journal called Sri Darpan, etc. And uh, Shobhna Nijahavan has worked on the record. So has Francesca, Charu, Gupta. All these people have worked on the uh, documents from these organizations. It is around uh, the First World War that we see uh, things beginning to change. We first see a Muslim women's organization, the Anjumane Khawateen and Muslim, uh, Muslimin is sometimes here, or Islam also, two different names come uh, from 1914. 
it also has a Dakkan chapter. So it is there uh, based in Aligarh, but it also has a Dakkan chapter. Uh, the three organizations that we hear of for the next 50 years, at least in a sense, and which remain uh, in the leadership of the struggle, these are the most common, maybe all of you would have heard. That is the WIA, which is the Women's Indian Association, the, All in, uh, the National Council for Women in India, which was set up in 1925, and the All India Women's Conference, which comes up in 1927. Now, these three organizations, in a way, and of these, WIA, which is set up in 1917 with its headquarters in the Theosophical Society office, with its leaders having both um, some uh, very well-known names from political agitations like uh, Annie Besant, Margaret Cousins, uh, Dorothy Gina Rajdasa, there's uh, Amu Swaminathan, there's Sarojini Naidu. All these big names are part of the WIA. We also see another thing that these women leaders emerge as leaders of political movements also. For instance, be it the Home Rule League or later the mass Satyagrahas in the Gandhian movement. And they, uh, even though they hold responsibility in different organizations, but they dialogue and they communicate and they work together. So uh, the WIA um, emerges as one of the first in this uh, leadership. And I will start with uh, the, um, in this uh, meet, uh, in this lecture, as Manjit said, we will not be giving a narrative. So there are two documents that I'm focusing on. These two, after this background that I have given, there are two basic documents that I focus on. One is one of the most well-known documents of the Indian move, women's movement in terms of its pre-independence history. And that is the memorandum which the WIA and under the leadership of the WIA women give uh, when they meet with Montague, who's the Secretary of State for India and the British government, who is on uh, a visit to India. Uh, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Hear me, hear me, madam. Take care. Okay. Ah, so the WIA uh, drafts a memorandum which they take uh, and they hold, uh, they take a deputation to Montague, who's part of the Montague Chelmsford Re Reforms Committee that you would have all read about in history in 1919 later, the uh, Re Act comes. But in, it is in 1917 when uh, Chelmsford is the viceroy and Montague is uh, visiting India in connection with these reforms. And these women decide to give a memorandum and they go and meet him as a deputation. And I think that the memorandum, even though it is already very well known, but I think we need to discuss it. Why do we need, and uh, the other document that I will be discussing will be uh, re the report of the, uh, called the Women's Role in a Planned Economy, a report uh, which uh, the work started around 1937. Uh, the report is ready by 1939, but it gets printed only in 1946 or so, because in the interim period, the entire leadership of the committee with whose report this is, they were almost all either in jail or had to run helter-skelter thanks to the 42 movement and other movements. So this um, uh, 37, uh, this report of the uh, what I call the, in short, WRPE, Women's Role in a Planned Economy. These are the two documents and the interim period. The first document, and I, when I focus on these two documents, I do not wish to say that these documents should be read in isolation. In fact, the whole purpose of reading through these documents is to understand the context and the location from which these documents are emerging. Uh, we also need to understand then that when we talk about movements, what is it that we are talking about? What does a movement comprise? There are many who still argue that no, pre-independence India did not have a women's movement. And I think we need to see what is a women's movement? How do we read 
the history of the movement. Before that, we will just briefly go to this document. This document in 1917, it says that we demand that when the franchise is being drawn up, women may be recognized as people. And it, it may be worded in such terms as will not disqualify our sex, but allow our women the same opportunities of representation as our men. It further goes on to say that the women of India have awakened to their responsibilities. I'm not reading the whole document. I'm just uh, taking out select sentences. So the women of India have awakened to their responsibilities in the public life and have their own independent opinions about the reforms that are necessary for the progress of India. It goes on to mention organizations and some of their leaders. It speaks of a new outlook of Indian women. It says that women of India understand and support the broad claims of their people for self-government. I'm sorry, there's some disturbance. I don't know where that is coming from, but I will continue. They mention Gandhi and the, the reform process and the whole struggle for independence. It says as, that we, as one half of the people, are directly affected by the demand in the United scheme. And that therefore the government should think of as broad a franchise as possible. And it should be extended directly to the people. And they pray that again, we, that when franchise is being drawn up, women may be recognized as people and be given the same opportunities. It also then, of course, goes on to make very specific demands apart from the right to vote on uh, compulsory and free primary education for boys and girls. You can imagine in 1917, this says, and a widely extended secondary level education, it goes to demand and says, that government should immediately devote all attention to this. Towards the end, it makes a very interesting, we have to understand this is still early days of nationalism also, or the anti-imperialist struggle of this phase. So they do talk about the empire and say we are loyally devoted to the empire, but in the same breath, in the same sentence, we say that we are committed in a sense to public life of the motherland. Who, that we love so well. And even though they sign as the most ob obedient ser servants, I think what we need to understand is that the memorandum, in a sense, signifies a collective beginning to explore new pathways of rights, of asserting rights, of claiming rights, of demanding, and also, in a sense, compelling the state and the governments that be to listen to what the women of India are saying. And even though they represent a, a very, let us say, elite section to some extent and very educated women, but they speak on behalf of the entire community of women in India. And I think that ability, that commitment that the women's movement showed from its very early beginnings in India to speak on behalf of others, to speak on behalf of the mass of women. Uh, we will always pick holes and say, no, they did not speak on this or that or the other. But I think that commitment to want to do so, to claim to do so, was also making a claim vis-a-vis -vis the colonial government in India, which was denying anything in the order of a subject's claims to citizenship. So in a sense, this memorandum is the first very clear collective articulation of a claim to citizenship, in a sense, challenging British imperialism and the premises of British, of the imperialist state. And I think to that extent, this memorandum and the claims that the deputation made are still very, very important. I will immediately go to the next document and then maybe come back when there is time to what happens in between, because what happens in between is equally important. Now, uh, the second document is again coming from one 
it's a committee. It is a committee which is set up by the Congress. The Congress is uh, in a phase of ministries. All of you may know that between 1937 and 1939, under the 1935 Act, there were uh, provincial governments in which uh, there were Indians who were sitting in government. Uh, uh, different parties or different formations had governments like Punjab would have the Unionist Party, uh, UP had the Congress. So we are talking about this phase when the Congress realizes that it may be coming to power soon, that there may be some form of independence or self-rule, self-government coming in, and it tries to lay out a vision for the future. It is at this time that uh, uh, I think Subhash Chandra Bose is the president of the Congress and a national planning committee is set up under the uh, chairmanship of uh, Jawaharlal Nehru with KT Shah as the um, sort of member secretary of this committee. And the NPC, as we call it, the National Planning Committee has some 29, I think, 27 or 29 subcommittees. And one of these, which is set up a bit later, but it is called the Subcommittee on Women, whose report is called the Women's Role in a Planned Economy. It is a kind of a vision document. And it is, I think, a very, very relevant document. Because in a sense, it is coming to terms with the status of women in colonial India and saying, look, this is what we are promise and this is what we are going to look for. It's also important that in a sense, it the um, uh, Katie Shah's introduction to uh, WRPE, as I call it, lays out a very specific objective. It says, what is the role of planning? That the role of planning is to take justice, equal rights, equality to all citizens and to bring about change in the lives of the people, including the women. So what has been going on, the colonialism that we have seen, the denial of citizenship, the denial of equality, the denial of justice, and the whole exploitative regime that colonialism has produced and is implementing, that has to be challenged so that the role of the planned economy will be to sort of undo everything wrong that colonialism has brought about in Indian society and with a commitment to change and a commitment to equality. Now, when we see the dismantling of the planning commission in sort of many, many decades later, it may be interesting to see, was that goal being sort of dismantled also or removed as an objective that the planning commission is done away with. So what does the uh, WRP says, we must remember that the uh, WRP comes in a context, it's a sort of pre pre independence phase, there has been a huge depression. Nowadays, we are think, seeing and uh, hearing talk of economic depression, etc. But the world has seen the Great Depression and the British Empire has uh, sort of experienced and witnessed this uh, Great Depression in different ways and tried to pass on the costs of the depression and the um, sort of uh, ravages of the depression to the Indian citizens because the Indian uh, empire is one of the biggest. We've seen a huge civil disobedience movement on the heels of the Great Depression um, and a challenge, but the deepening of the imperial crisis of, of the structures and of administration a very consistent confrontation in terms of the demands for rights on the uh, whole issue of the right to vote, which the 1917 memorandum first raised on behalf of women, even before the Congress or any other political party had done that, the women raised the demand for their vote and their vote for all women. Uh, it's a very important point because uh, the Congress, which articulates the mass opinion of this period, in a sense, does so only in 1931 at the Karachi resolution. But the women have already been campaigning, canvassing, and mobilizing around this for almost 14, 15 years by this time. The WRP comes after the 1935 Government of India Act, which has already put certain systems of provincial governments in place. 
and there are very active movements by during the uh, from the late 20s to the early 40s we see some of the most uh, some of the biggest mass movements in indian uh, in the indian freedom struggle so the whole uh, questioning and confrontation of imperialism has become a much wider sort of uh, social uh, movement in this period the wrp i'll just quickly go through the chapterization to give you an idea it talks about economic rights property rights education it has a chapter which is very interestingly called marriage and its problems then it has a chapter on family life of course there are miscellaneous issues etc what do they actually focus on as i said economic rights education property rights marriage and social these are the three four main chapters and there are differences on that but it is interesting that they come up with two three uh, observations which are in a sense the maxims of the report which are they see women as economic beings as making a contribution to the economy they talk about women's work in the family and sort of what we are discussing today in terms of the unpaid labor of women they talk about uh, women's timings and they say look the woman's day is never ending because housework never ends so they even say there should be some national timings for the kitchen to be wound up so that women get some leisure there's a whole oh section God. on the right to leisure for women it um, did they the committee members did a detailed study so they were aware of women's rights across both the socialist and the capitalist world uh, china ussr usa uk japan latin america peru chile argentina they were very familiar with whatever was available at that time and it the uh, committee uh, emphasizes the report emphasizes the linkages between development development policies economic indices and the social cultural aspect so they do not sort of um, dump the socio cultural prejudices in terms of all oh, these are historical baggage and tradition and we can't do anything about it they take it on they confront it head long uh and the debates in the there are debates there are, there's a concept of matrimonial property they confront the question of what we call illegitimate children and they say look the children have to have rights it's no fault of theirs that whatever for whatever reason the relationship between the parents fell apart or whatever the circumstances but the legality of that relationship should not affect the rights of children um uh, they talk about crashes in a very big way in terms of the chapters on women's work etc there's a section on nationality they draw up a children's charter they look at uh, exclusion and discrimination because we must remember this is brit still british times and women were not allowed to enter certain professions or certain occupations <laughs> so these people discuss all that they dis talk about social insurance um they discuss reservation but they are not in favor of reservation um uh, they feel women must have equal entry both in terms of jobs and in terms of the political domain uh there is a very detailed discussion on property rights and uh, marriage related laws and the diversity of uh, laws they uh, on uh, one of these aspects there is a debate and a difference of opinion and a dissent note by kapila khanwala on the whole issue of the common civil code or the uniform civil law uh, code as it came to be known uh, there is both an appreciation of the diversity as well as the desire or the uh, need felt for common rights for all women uh they discuss and they are appalled at the whole uh, notion of the restitution of conjugal rights you will remember that there has been the rukma bai case before this and uh, which had shocked the whole country uh, they uh, have a, a whole discussion on birth control and limitation of the family uh the 
views they express here are very problematic say if we look at it in today's times because they discuss uh, very eugenistic because so in the name of the health of the nation they want to in a sense control the number of children who has children what kind of children so healthy children to be uh, born uh, the report does not have too much on caste but it is not as if it is totally missing it does talk about for instance that whatever it the statement they make is whatever purpose it may have served in the past the system as it prevails today has helped in keeping back the progress of the community it has created inequality among the members of the same community by keeping down those who belong to the lower castes for the benefit of those who call themselves as belonging to the upper castes it also questions caste in terms of the rules governing marriage and practices it questions caste in terms of the restrictions that upper caste norms place on widows etc but more fundamentally they make a very clear statement that any system for social order which promotes inequality is fundamentally opposed to the spirit of democracy and democratic planning in so far therefore as the caste system tends to retain inequality or to obstruct women's advance it must be progressively put an end to so what i'm saying is they have a discussion on unmarried mothers prostitution abortion and they come up with a whole set of uh, recommendations this uh, report doesn't have too much on women in the peasantry and in agriculture because the national planning committee had a separate uh, committee on rural uh, agrarian questions etc so what i'm saying is and these women i mean if i give you the names of some of those who were there they remained active till say when i come into the movement you will have heard the names of uh, um of course uh, uh you know uh, the head is uh, rani lakshmi bai rajwade there is um, uh, sarabhai mridula sarabhai this vijay lakshmi pandit uh, there's um, aruna asafali there's uh, vidya gauri nilkant i'm i mean i'm just giving off hand some names but this is where these women come from now why do i talk about these two reports and now let me come to what happens in between you know to satisfy those queries who believe that actually there was who may still believe that there was no women's movement in india let me tell you that the three major concerns that come out from both the documents there it is about political rights and of course education which they see as linked to the struggle for rights women's work life work and contribution to the economy and lastly the socio cultural domain in with which is related the whole issue of laws legal rights etc what has gone on in between by the time this committee gives its report there has been already a huge amount of effort both in terms of mass mobilizations in terms of mass mobilizations of different segments and um, uh, representations to the british government for instance massive mobilization on the child marriage uh, restraint act both the uh, sharda bill and the law that we finally see with and if you see the um, um, committee reports and the evidence uh, which came before the child marriage restraint act you will be surprised to find that you know nowadays when we think of the women's movement we only think of the big metros and we think of delhi bombay calcutta madras bangalore etc but you would be surprised to see where the representations to the child marriage restraint act are coming from and how active women's groups were in some of these what we would call today the small and medium towns including in the princely states um a child marriage restraint act is one subsequently we see mobilizations in the general strikes uh, and women work uh, workers were a 
prominent feature and unions making efforts to register more women as members despite you know all my great friends radha kumar and everyone talking about the male predominance in the unions and i don't challenge that there is no male dominance and there is patriarchy nevertheless the unions in this period made a very very significant attempt and a fairly successful attempt uh for instance uh, in 1941 i think if you there's a bombay worker strike where 2000 women sit on a hunger strike a fast in bombay 2000 women and there is a diary of one of the workers on this strike uh which is there it's about a 40 page diary of a woman worker who's sitting on strike and on one day 2000 women sit on a hunger strike in bombay i'm asking you is that possible so easily today in this day and age and if the unions were only a uh, hotbeds of patriarchal domination it surely wouldn't happen that's not the way unions work if any of you have ever worked or tried to get close to a union yes of course there's patriarchy but there is much more much else also apart from patriarchy in the unions so what we are seeing then is that in 30s of course the civil disobedience movement women were very much there uh, you uh, read any of the writings on uh, modern india whether it's sumit sarkar's books or any of the others there's enough evidence to show how much uh, there was uh, the towards the end of the 30s and uh, particularly the 40s of course i mean the whole uh, scene changes with the big peasant uh, upsurges in the form of tebhaga the telangana movement the worli movement of the tribals in thane uh, big uh, uh, mobilizations of women under the Maha mahila atmaraksha samiti and the women self defense league in punjab all over and almost every state has for instance andhra has its mahila sabha uh, every state has this kind of mobilization but what i'm saying is you know we still um, and of course peasant women peasant women were very much part even when you read about chori chora all the descriptions talk about women in these meetings now you know this raises a question for many of us what do we understand by the women's movement i think this question comes up much more fundamentally today because the today the label we are using and the terminology we are using is that i mean we do not uh, many of my younger colleagues and my own age colleagues do not talk of the women's movement everyone prefers to talk of the feminist movement in india i feel that the women's movement and the mobilizations that women saw throughout the 20th century go far beyond fitting into any feminist frame you know now these people say oh we should ask for a feminist policy i'm asking you which government will have a feminist policy and what would that policy be after all governments represent ruling classes those ruling classes have an ideology those ideologies serve a purpose and that purpose is to perpetuate the interests and the rules of those ruling classes are we trying to say that women across all these different caste classes can have the same ideology can any government today that we are looking at and this we are looking at the capitalist system we are looking at bourgeois democracies can any government claim to transcend all this and have one gender sensitive feminist policy i have my questions it doesn't mean that we do not confront those governments and those states with our demands or with our issues yes every government should be made accountable towards having a more gender sensitive policy but to think that one label of feminism uh and does this feminism that we espouse does it confront ruling class ideologies to my mind it doesn't so why is it important to talk about these issues as one of my closest senior colleagues i can call her today although we were both in the movement she was much much senior and one of the pioneers of women studies 
in India, Bina Mazumdar, when she was writing about some of these issues, what did she say? She says, one of the syndromes manifested by the present phase of globalization is the disappearance or appropriation of earlier diverse voices, perspectives, and concepts by the dominant framework of gender. What is she pointing to? She's pointing to the fact that if we try to sort of uh, foreground only one given framework of gender, I would say feminism, then in a sense, it can be erasing, blotting out, undermining various other trends, thoughts, ideologies, ideas which surface in the movement and which need to be discussed, which need to be given space, even if they are to be confronted. We may disagree with some of those ideas, but they need to be discussed in order to be confronted and in order to for that negotiation to happen in the movement. At a time when there are attempts being made to appropriate the narrative appropriate all narratives in a sense and to appropriate and sort of re-narrativize the history of the women's movement from all kinds of anti-women perspectives. I think it is very important that we are sensitive to these kind of issues. We also need to be sensitive to these issues because the needs today are much greater. You know, there is a general sense when you say that the British left us alone, the British did not touch the private domain. I don't know what is the private domain for women in colonial India. The women who were working on the fields and the farms, in the plantations, in the factories, they faced exploitation and oppression on a daily basis. And I'm not just talking about broad forms of oppression. If anyone thinks that women were spared in any manner, the kind of violence that we see today, I'll just give two, I'll cite two reports as an instance, only two reports. There is enough in our archives to give you that kind of history on a daily basis, but I'll cite two reports. For instance, in 1932, we get the report of the agrarian distress in the United Provinces. And the committee uh, comprises of uh, Govind Balapant, Rafi Ahmed Kidwai, and VN Tibari. No, no woman in the committee. And yet, what do we find? Women come forward and talk about oppression, meaning they said we were stripped naked, we were paraded, we were beaten. Uh, Attempts were made to ins the insert um, objects in our private parts. They give details. They give details. They said we were denied the right to draw water from the wells for at least three days. And they talk about the punishments. And this is, you know, why I'm raising it. We tend to think, oh, no woman on the committee means these aspects will not come out. No, even then, in, as far back as 1932, these aspects come about. They lay bare the claims of the British government to the rule of law. They lay bare the claims that Catherine Mayo is making in her book about how British rule is to take India out of barbaric phase because India's history is specific and peculiar. These women and their stories challenge. For instance, if you look at uh, what happens during martial law, there is uh, in Teen Murti, for instance, in the library, if you go, there is this, what we call the minority report of disturbances in the Punjab. And the minority report is the dissidents report. And the minority report in the first section itself, you hear that when martial law was imposed in Punjab uh, around the time of, uh, uh, what, uh, what's your, Jallianwala and the whole episodes around that in Lahore, martial law is imposed. And these women talk about rape, sexual violence, maybe in a different terminology and women of different communities, not only one community. So what I'm saying is that if we look at this history, we not only discover our own history, it also lays bare the, it exposes the hollow claims of colonial rulers. It exposes the falseness of the discourse of the imperialists that this was the white man's burden and they were here because India did not know how to govern itself and they were going to come here to govern us. 
and tell us uh, what to do. In fact, the struggles and the work that we see in and specifically by the women's organizations, you will be surprised. I mean, there were, as I said earlier, there were three main areas in which the women's organizations worked. One was the issue of political rights, where there is a continuous engagement. There are debates, and those debates give clues to later debates, and not just later debates, but issues which are still, still a concern. For instance, the women's organizations start with the understanding that all women should have the right to vote, and we do not look for um, reservations. Around the late 20s, 30s, the climate is beginning to change. Begum Shahnawaz Khan actually accepts and tries to push the demand for reservations for minorities. Now, we may disagree because we disagree with the basis for religion based reservations. But I think we should understand what is the issue that was being raised was that in independent India, will minorities have a place? Will minorities have their right to represent? Will their voice be heard? Will there be space for diversity in independent India? I think that is a question that still exists. The whole question of reservation in jobs for women, that has been a debate right through in the women's movement also. The other aspect, but one thing that they continue to give the signal to the imperial government is we will negotiate, but we will not compromise on the right to representation. That is in unnegotiable in a sense, inalienable right they're demanding. So that is one stream of thought. The other stream of thought is around the issue of women's work. And I think there are very deep insights in the uh, report of the WRP. The third is the most problematic, and it remains a problem till today. And that is the sociocultural domain where marriage, family law, personal law, all these issues come in, widows' rights, and there are debates about should widows be allowed to remarry despite the uh, struggles in the 19th century and Ishwar Chand Vidya Sagar's campaign and the whole uh, law in 1861, 1856, etc. But what we find is that there are still reservations and there is a resistance from the upper castes about it. It is there that Ambedkar and later Periyar also, they are making their interventions. And I think those interventions are having an impact in different regions. In the North, we have the Aris Samaj. There are the different social reform movements which continue through the 20th century. But ultimately, it is the women's organizations which become the voice of the people. And in the whole issue on sociocultural rights, the, both the concerns come up. The concern to have equal rights for all women, as well as the concern to preserve the diversity and to open up new avenues for women of all sections. Uh, I think I'm going to stop here because you told me 45 minutes. I have much more to say, but Manjeet, I will stop here so that you can uh, you have time for questions and answers. Okay? Yeah, in fact, uh, in fact, if you can, maybe you can take maybe five more minutes if you want to, because I haven't got many questions as yet, unless people put now, because I have got only just one or two questions still now. I was wondering if they, if people have questions. I even requested in case they have want to write, then they can write right away. Somebody had written as to what were the uh, what were the uh, activities which are banned and the which women could not do in colonial times. So this is the only kind of question which I've got as yet. Oh, uh, well, uh, it was not so much as banned. You see, uh, two three things. One is there is a social taboo against women doing certain things, women going out, etc. That's the broad social framework and environment. But the second point you have to remember is that women's literacy was very low. So women had no entry into occupations where 
uh, uh, I mean, a certain amount of literacy was required, a certain amount of educational qualification was required. Uh, the only uh, uh, sort of uh, welcoming occupational groups are teachers for that to like elementary, primary school teachers, etc. Uh, women's entry into the working class was not banned at all. In fact, women, I think they were uh, proportionately, in terms of proportionate to the working class altogether, uh, they were, uh, uh, say in the mines, for instance, one third of the people working in underground uh, uh, work profile of the mines was women and children. They were nearly 40% in the mines, in the coal mines and Rani Gun, Jharia, all this. And there are huge, there's an AIWC report on that. There's a government report, of course. There's a Congress report also on uh, the women in the uh, mines. Um, um, uh, there's, uh, then um, uh, they were uh, graduating from being uh, a &Ms, midwives, et cetera, to nurses. And then, uh, but the nursing profession is actually getting a push, not so much because they want more nurses, uh, more women in nursing, but because of the Second World War, primarily, I mean, some bit happens in the First World War, but when the Second World War is coming up, uh, the colonial government is very keen on training nurses. So you'd be surprised to know, I mean, uh, even in schools, not just nursing schools separately. And uh, if you live in Delhi, for instance, you would have seen the Lady Reading School uh, near Bara Hindu Rao. This is one of, because Lady Reading was one of the uh, viceroys of that period who took a specific interest in uh, nursing training. But uh, from my own experience, I can tell you that people like my mother who went to school during that period around the Second World War, they were given nursing training in schools. My mother had diplomas uh, run by the, uh, for courses run by the St. John's Ambulance and the Salvation Army and all these people. And these trainings were conducted in schools. So they also had their own interests. The British colonial government had its own interest when it was pushing nursing. But for instance, uh, uh, the medical profession was, you know, uh, doctors were recruited as part of the army. And in that, to begin with, women were not allowed to enter. And when they did, then it was British or Anglo-Indian women more. There's a, for instance, you can see figures about how many um, doctors and uh, which, what's their background. So it is only towards the end of the 30s, really, that more doctors as Indians start coming. Otherwise, it's primarily the uh, British and then the Anglo-Indians. Of course, Lady Dufferin is, uh, and the Lady Dufferin Fund is known to have uh, pushed some of this education. For instance, in railways, etc., they would be, you know, they would be employed in the cleaning professions in the more low level menial professions, but not in the, not in the judiciary, not in the, I mean, those are still issues for us. But at that time there were certain bars and the um, uh, WRP has a whole section talking about that and demanding that these disqualifications should be removed. Not only that, the All India uh, Women's Conference and the National Co uh, Council of Women in India come up by the 19, uh, late 30s, 40s. Um, they have what is called the Indian Women's Charter in 1946, I think, uh, the AIWC has. They also have a memorandum on sex-linked disqualifications. So they list out the disqualifications, which are both in terms of the law and in terms of opportunities. And I think this becomes a very big um, uh, point in terms of propagating. And like all such documents, you know, the documents serve uh, multiple purposes. You go to the government as a deputation and make a demand, but you also use your memorandum to mobilize, to build public opinion, to set goals, to negotiate. For instance, when you're saying in 1917, you're putting forward a demand for the right to vote. It is preceding the 
Congress having accepted women's right to vote. So you're in a sense, you're negotiating within the movement. You're negotiating with other women who may be saying that, no, you I mean, we are not qualified to do this. We don't have the confidence. You're also negotiating that space in the public domain. You get that? Hey, can we take more questions? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, there are two more questions. One is, one person is asking as to any other organizational activities on the Northeast if in that period of 19th century, if you could kindly elaborate. And the other one is that uh, I would like to ask uh, important contribution of mobilization. Thank you. Uh, mobilization of organize, organized women was the expansion of the ideological repertoire of the Indian national through the discourse of liberal Indian feminist feminism in the context you, you are talked about. So basically they're saying that they're also feminist contribution. And uh, you read an excerpt from the archives that raised the issue of different forms of violence against women, women back, uh, back then. And even today, we witness such horrendous and violent acts against women of all ages and stages of life. Why do you think we are all still there? And how can we, as a society, rise above them? So these are some, with some, some observation and some questions of young people so these are mixed uh, i'm not sure on the northeast uh, the mobilizations are different the organization of course uh, the most well known in the northeast is uh, rani gadialu's uh, revolt uh, and uh, of the women of manipur that is the most well known for the pre independence period I would tend to say that the archives in Guwahati and some of the other places where the, that material would be available would have much more. Uh, but it is also likely that the Northeastern revolts would have seen women rising as part of the tribals and the tribes who are revolting against the British government or whoever else may have been the local ruler. And that raises a question for all of us. Um, but Rani Gadialus is the most well-documented. She was uh, imprisoned and then she had to be released. I think Nehru's government released her. It's known as the Nupilan and uh, second Nupilan, all that. Uh, that is documented. I also have the documents from that. Uh, there are also certain other mobilizations which you hear of in terms of the labor inquiry in 1906, I think, and then again in the 20s and 24, the Assam labor inquiry report uh, talks about some of the um, issues over there. The plantation labor revolts are very much there. Even Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay in her book talks about it. but. Um, I talked about the uh, inquiry committees that AIWC and some of these people put up. They also talk about it. Um, uh, they had a whole inquiry on the plantations, in fact, in this period. And WRP has a, a also a whole thing. And plantations, as you would know, uh, since uh, women's presence in the plantations is a very big presence, the pluckers are primarily women. So the women's struggles uh, for plantation workers are very clearly there. Um, this question of violence uh, or, or, and the other point about uh, liberal feminism. Look, what I would say is uh, as far as violence is concerned, I personally uh, believe that violence is a manifestation of the inequality that women are subjected to. But that inequality is not always and not only on account of gender. The inequality for a woman in India may come as for a Dalit landless woman. It is on account of her being Dalit and landless and then a woman. So the specific manifestation of violence against a woman takes on a sexual on the form of sexual violence. But it is not as if that, that violence is being perpetrated on her only on account of her being a woman. Uh, and I would say that for any number of locations and contexts in which sexual violence against women is perpetrated, be it tribal women, be it women in the Northeast. You know, the 
uh, roots of the conflict lie in other things. The roots of conflict lie in terms of the political domain. But when women protest or when women are to be punished, then the form of punishment, the form of reprisal, the form of asserting power, the form of asserting class, caste or political power in any co uh, conflict or in a conflict zone, that is specifically gendered in the case of women. But it is those categories of women who are more vulnerable to that. All women are vulnerable to sexual violence, but specific categories of women or women in special locations of deprivation and powerlessness are more vulnerable to those situations where this kind of perpetration of violence happens. So the fight against violence has to keep these structural roots in mind. It has to keep in mind the embeddedness of this violence in other structures of inequality. So it is not just patriarchy. It is a ma ma it is man that power is manifest through a patriarchal assertion and atrocity and that is inflicted on the woman's body. But that power does not come from patriarchy alone always. That is my belief. And it is a continuum in women's life in terms of what kind of violence they witness the specific. Uh, I mean, from the 70s, when we were coming into the movement, I remember, we talked about the rural uh, scenario where it was landlords, armies, caste-based armies, which, and you know, um, uh, we, uh, women would often be alone, especially today also, if you look at it, when the migrants come out, if there are only men who are going out and the women are left behind, then there is a vulnerability of the woman-headed household in effect over there, or the woman who's left behind. Uh, in some cases, when I have done interviews with migrant families, they have told me that we go sequentially. All the men don't go away at the same time. Some men stay behind. But the fact that the man may stay behind doesn't mean that violence can be totally rooted out because violence comes from power and the power comes also from the uh, backing of the machinery. So uh, the... Uh, that uh, wider linkage is something the women's movement has always kept in mind when we have talked about uh, the uh, caste uh, class linkages of inflicting atrocities. And it has been the experience of the movement. In terms of the whole issue of liberal feminism, uh, I believe that uh, while Colonial India definitely saw a phase of liberal feminism um, or what would you would call the manifestations of expression of women's protest in the mode of what liberal feminists do. But I don't think it was that alone. The peasant revolts and women's uh, active involvement in peasant revolts and movements uh, definitely was not under any liberal feminist framework. Yes, the educated upper upper middle class and land owning women from the princely states, uh, to the extent that they were imbibing certain values, they often went uh, traveled abroad, had experiences, be it the princely uh, class women or other educated Indian middle class women, um, very elite, of course, as I said, wives of ICS officers, etc. But they played a definite role, you know, uh, elite women in a scenario where the mass of Indian women are denied education, these elite women played a big role. Yes, they may have been, their perspectives may have been sort of circumscribed by their class location. But I think many made a, a conscious attempt to transcend their location in terms of their privileges and look at uh, the condition of women beyond their own caste, class, family, and individual location. And I think it is not just them as individuals. I think we have to understand that the phase of anti-imperialism 
the struggles of anti-imperialism, not only anti-imperialism, but feudalism, because women's oppression was linked. After all, there is a there is an alliance between the imperialists and the feudal classes in this period. So when agrarian uh, revolts are happening, it is equally the feudal class which is being challenged as much as the colonial government, which exacts high rates of revenue. But it is the feudal class because the peasant, as we always say, he pays uh, reven uh, rent. He the pays the tenant farmer pays rent to the landlord and the landlord pays the revenue. The tenant farmer doesn't directly pay revenue to the British government in throughout India. That is the case in colonial uh, uh, times. Now, that, that conflict which the tenant farmer or the peasant family has vis-a-vis -vis the landlord, that is rooted in feudal exploitation and oppression. And we all know how feudal oppression is equally linked to the issue of patriarchal assertion of power vis-a-vis -vis women. So that linkage is very much there. And that is why women come out very openly in the peasant movements. There's hardly any peasant movement that you see in Indian history in colonial times where women are not present because for them, it is their everyday life and experience. And uh, I think the Telangana and Tebhaga studies make it very, very clear as also Godavari's own book on uh, the worldly uh, uh, struggle. And, and of course, now we have much more historical research on it. So that is, I mean, it is intertwined. It is inherent that conflict and contradiction are inherent. Unfortunately, what we are finding today is that even that perception that women and women's movement and women's organizations had in colonial India, it seems to have gone missing because when you, you know, when you, define your struggle within a feminist narrative or a gender narrative, you in a sense do away with the class linkage, do away with the class, because in a sense you are saying that this is a woman's perspective. What, when we speak of the women's movement in terms of its wider caste class linkages, we keep in mind those divisions in society. And we make specific efforts to draw in women from certain sections and classes. Unfortunately, to my mind, the feminist movement that we see today and I don't want to run down the feminist movement at all. But what is happening is that because of this huge urban middle class that we have, this urban middle class is so taken up by the experience of its own denials, of its own exclusions, of its own discriminations, that that attempt and that effort that should be made to build wider linkages with other cross sections of society, that is not always there. You know, I'm saying that very consciously because even in terms of what we see as Dalit feminism, sometimes we find that the Dalit women's question is also being defined from a very, very much more urban location. But the roots of the conflict and the violence which Dalit women face regularly, it's an ongoing process, lie in that system of land ownership, power, and denial and discrimination, which is rooted in our land relations. Unfortunately, those struggles, except in certain tribal belts or in certain areas of peasant movements, those are not happening. So in the women's movement, our consciousness and our alertness to those wider roots and linkages sometimes get muted also because there are just so many of us. We're just so many, you know, the middle class women are today the big bulky presence in the women's movement. And sometimes I think we need to stop and look beyond ourselves. It's absolutely imperative if our movement has to make an impact socially. It has to go beyond articulating. I'm not saying articulation of middle class women's demands is wrong. But for the women's movement to get um, to gather greater strength, it has to once again attempt to build those linkages. Some of the mass organizations have those linkages, 
but in the projection of the women's movement and particularly in the projection of the feminist movement what is happening is it is being sort of uh, it is overlapping with a kind of middle class articulation of women's very very legitimate demands and i don't disagree with those demands and can we have two more questions yeah yeah uh, one is of course that uh, one is asking as to who are more responsible for women's subordination in india is it colonial regime or indigenous patriarchal system and the other one is a little longish but uh, in the lecture you made an observation in the difference between the women movement and feminist movement in india and how the younger generation tend to call it feminist movement could you please elaborate the difference between the two because many countries in europe and even in canada can came up with the feminist policies so are uh, so are you saying they are missing the whole point of the women's movement altogether in fact you have been elaborating on this already but then let's see uh, look who's more responsible you can't say you, we don't want to uh, give a free license to our indigenous patriarchs whoever <laughs> they may be okay so they are of course guilty of whatever patriarchy they practice but the point that i would make as both a student of history and somebody who's looked at the women's movement i think imperialism and the whole system of imperialism and the policies that they implemented in a sense constituted the social frame within uh, that patriarchy was also perpetuated so uh, there's no question of uh, who's the bigger or who's more responsible i think colonialism definitely was confronted and it had to go and it went thankfully we would be wrong in thinking that it was only colonialism which was perpetuating exploitation and oppression on women because as i said firstly they had their feudal allies and the feudal allies were very very visible in even in the 40s in india so life in india uh, you know after all it wasn't always the viceroy and his men who were coming into your fields it was the landlords men who were coming all the mukaddams and everything that we hear of or in uh, the plantations you know the naikins the some of them were women also let me tell you who were perpetuating some of these systems of uh, oppression uh, in the plantations it is well known there were women sardars there are even today women sardars meaning you know in the recruitment and the contractors even today in migration when we study there are women who are also part of the trafficking process so you know uh, while the gender divides are there but there are many um, uh, sections of people who cross the gender divide in terms of uh, perpetuating oppression and exploitation because oppression and exploitation and patriarchy are systemic they are not only individual link that this man is patriarchal and he inflicts his patriarchal authority on me as an individual after all these are systems of oppression and exploitation and they have their roots in the so wider social structures and i think that has been the biggest gain in the women's movement that historically we have sort of tracked and uncovered these structures of oppression so colonialism and feudalism are both part of that system within which Uh, patriarchal structures are embedded as is the modern indian state the modern indian state is equally struck uh, you know a patriarchal structure and if we think that we can fight patriarchy individually without confronting the state and i when i say state i mean the state structures i don't mean a, a particular government it is states it's inherent in the policies where funds go how policies are uh determined and decided and that is why uh, for at least 40 years the women's movement that some of us have been a part of have has engaged with those policies uh, be it uh, the plan process be it other uh, policies uh, that governments come up with and uh, successive governments so these um, debates have to go on and they are not uh, centered around individuals of course it is true that in the life of a woman 
that patriarchy is enacted, uh, inflicted and implemented through individuals who may be men and also some women. But uh, we would be wrong in believing that our fight against these individuals in our life will put an end to patriarchy. I think our lives will end, but that patriarchy is not going to end by just our, uh, but it's part of our life. So we fight because after all, we struggle for our own individual rights as much as we struggle for women's rights in a more abstract capacity and in a more abstract formulation. But that's the that's the conflict that we undergo as individuals, but we are all individuals who are social beings and our lives are being constructed and framed by the policies that our society, our governments, uh, the institutions within which we function, they uh, draw. And there, there is an inherent patriarchy in most of these structures, which needs to be confronted at every step, at every level also. Uh, as far as feminism go, you know, this is a long debate. It's not going to end in this session because I have my own views and experience and you have your own views, experience, understanding and your aspirations. I have no, uh, I have no issue with feminism. It's not as if I disagree with feminism per se. I disagree with projecting feminism and the feminist movement as the be all and end all of the women's movement. That I'm very clear about in my own understanding, because I believe, and you know, it is, uh, for instance, um, I mean, uh, this is a long debate. Maitri Chaudhary's written about it. Mary's written about it. I've written about it in my piece on Neera Ben uh, in the Indian Journal of Gender Studies. For instance, someone like Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay, she never called herself a feminist. Now, she, here is a woman who defied every, every norm of patriarchy in colonial times in a sense. But she doesn't see herself. Sarojini Naidu was very clear and she made a public speech saying, look, our movement is not that type of feminist movement, etc. What is the debate as far as I'm concerned? For me, it is not about feminism being having a Western origin or anything. In my mind and from my thinking, feminism to me is a bourgeois ideology. It remains a bourgeois ideology, no matter how expanded a version of feminism you may try to define. And I think Uma, uh, Uma Chakravarti, um, Gita, many of them have tried to conceptually develop both the concepts of patriarchy and of feminism, and there are many others. But I mean, I'm sorry, there are about 100 feminisms floating around. If I read Padma's book, uh, Padma Anagol, then there's imperial feminism, then there's something called white feminism, apart from the liberal, socialist, radical feminisms that are being taught in all women's studies courses. Then there may be black feminism, then there may be uh, Dalit feminism today in India. There are any number of feminisms. What I'm saying is the word feminist doesn't convey anything to me except saying that it concerns a woman or it concerns it is concerned with women, that's all. But you can have, I mean, I, I have myself encountered people who have talked to me about indigenous feminism. Now, I don't know what this indigenous feminism will be. Will this indigenous feminism defend and uphold indigenous capitalism tomorrow? Will it confront neoliberal uh, capitalism? Will it confront the uh, neoliberal capitalism led globalization policies? What I'm saying is that to me, this word, because the only way feminism is sought to be defined, even within the movement that I am part of in India, is with a suffix or a prefix. Without that prefix, it doesn't mean anything. By and large, except for saying it is womanist and it is about women. Now, I mean, you know, I'm sorry, but uh, every woman who writes is not a feminist. Or is she? I'm asking you, is she? Every woman who paints, is she a feminist artist? So what is feminism then? That is my worry and that is my query. And that is why, to me, the larger uh, ambit 
of the women's movement in India, it allows for different ideological formulations, which was the history in colonial times. There were the leftists, there were the communists, there were the socialists. Kamala Devi is part of the Congress Socialist Party. She's in the AIWC, and in the AIWC, all these people work together. Pul Renu Guha heads the committee, which goes and inquires into the Rani Ganj, Haria, coal fields, etc. She's working under the All India Women's Conference. So All India Women's Conference allows for the Sultan Jahans and the Begums and the princely people. There is a larger umbrella there. Within that class caste, everything is operating. Within that, feudalism is operating. Within that, uh, the um, uh, Tatars, or, I mean, all the women from all these big families uh, or the um, white or the brown sahibs, as we call them, they're all there in these organizations, but they all play a part. It is important to understand and appreciate the part they play and yet be critically evaluating the roles they play. And I think that is the way social science proceeds, that we appreciate. You know, to say that they were not feminists is not to say that they were not revolutionaries. I think they were far more revolutionary than many of us in our day and age. Because they were challenging norms which were much more difficult in a society and in a phase of history which was much more difficult it's more easy for me to sit here and say it when you know i've done a phd um, when thousands and thousands of others have studied and reached levels even beyond mine but for these women widows durga bai i mean these are child widows some of them they come out of difficult marriages in a time when even Mahatma Gandhi can write i mean he can actually write a letter saying kamla devi is a divorcee so how, or whatever. So how can we make her the president of the organization? That that's that's the kind of prejudice that is prevailing in this day and age. I think these women were far ahead to be able to say that look, what you have a notion of illegitimate, but this child has rights. I think they were far ahead of their age. They had their debates. Many disagreed and said, "No, how can you say? How can you say you're upholding illegitimacy if you discuss rights of prostitutes when you're sort of uh, encouraging immoral uh, this thing? If you uh, ask for rights of widows, then you are dis uh, uh, encouraging immoral acts in society. This is the world that these women were up against. But they fought. They stood up." they applied their minds in a very rational manner and they chose to put these in policy documents and i think that has lasting value that you go do i have to interrupt there are yeah. three more questions okay yeah so we'll have little time now yeah so i will not be able to take any more questions now yeah. so uh, i know that women women took part in women's movement through their work it see one is asking us to if women took part in the women's movement through their work in art and poetry and how far this this was fruitful the second is how do you see the feminist movement where postmodernism has decentralized they destabilized the notion of universal femininity and took and take critical approach to previous feminist discourses can we take another one i will just read out uh, how would you like to uh, relate the mother india controversy with the women's movement or modern term feminism uh, would you say that trans, there's another question, would you say that the trans women's movement were not a part of Indian women's movement from the very beginning? Which, which movements were not part of? Uh, the uh, trans, see trans. they say the trans women's movement were not part of the Indian women's movement from the very beginning. Uh, I'm sorry, I haven't got it. Class or trans? They say, would you like, would you say that trans women's movement were not the part of Indian women's movement from the very beginning. I it's a movement. Okay, now uh, some of these are linked, so I'll just take them together. Sure. Uh, um, look, uh, I think uh, what we have seen over the last 40 years, especially through women's studies, but even through other disciplinary contributions and uh, developments in other disciplines also we have seen a, uh, I mean a total efflorescence of what we call women's art poetry 
reading, writing, etc. And I think it has given, uh, it has both enriched uh, the disciplines as well as enriched our appreciation of art and poetry or any kind of uh, expression, literary expression. Uh, some of it definitely has a visible, uh, potent feminist expression, but not all of it. All of it does not. And even if we were to look for that feminist expression, I would still say that just as we would uh, critically reflect on a, any writer's expression in terms of its class or caste biases or you know its linkages and its roots. I mean, for instance, there's this whole debate about Tolstoy, whether the peasant in the Tolstoy is a music or uh, what's it, uh, what's the, I'm forgetting the word even. Oh, it's so long ago that these debates happened in my life. But, um, uh, you know, the word we use for the peasant, how can I forget? But anyway, in terms of the class roots of the envisioning of the agent and agency of change, those questions would still arise. Okay. So they may be very powerful gendered expressions and may be very beautiful also. So we must appreciate those. That does not mean that we put away other critical lenses. So, you know, just because a woman is speaking, are we going to stop being critical in terms of our other trainings, uh, be it our literature training or my social science history training or my movement training? Are we going to put aside all that but just because there's a gender lens and a gender frame? What I'm saying is even within the gender lens, even within the gender frame, even within the feminist uh, gaze, there is a, there is something to do with caste, class, maybe race, maybe religion, maybe ethnicity, maybe nationality. Should we stop thinking about those critical perspectives? I'm saying no. Even a feminist gaze has to be deconstructed in terms of its social roots and social origins, as well as its social envisioning. There is no universal feminist gaze. I do not accept there is a universal woman or feminine category, but whether that femininity does not have its origins in other social locations, that I would not accept. A, a woman is not supra class. A woman is not supra caste. A woman is not supra nationality, as we have discovered in our own country in very, very concrete ways. That in the eyes of the state, in the eyes of the people, in the eyes of society, you are what you are. You may be a peasant, you may be a worker, you may be a domestic worker, you may be a manual scavenger, you may be a Hindu, you may be a Muslim, you may be a tribal, as the Northeast girls faced the kind of hostility in a city like Delhi. What I'm saying is you are what you are. You carry the victim possible victimhood of that identity, as well as the potential power of that identity, both. You carry, you are vulnerable to the victimhood, you are, uh, you have the power of the potential that your identity gives you. And I think identity has come up in a very big way over the last 20, 30 years as a very emotive category, as a potent category of both change as well as stifling change as well as stifling diversity and i think we need to think critically about that so that is where i will stop on that aspect as far as this mother india and feminism i'm not sure whether i understand are we saying mother india in terms of uh, mayo well mayo was an out and out spokesperson of imperialism out and out there's no doubt about it and i think gandhi did well to dismiss her but it wasn't just Gandhi alone. If you read the writing in the 30s, almost every journal that was coming out, every periodical that was coming out in India carried uh, pieces against, for or against, but many, many more against Catherine Mayo. Agnes Medley wrote against her, of all the people. I mean, she says, what is this woman saying? And she's a spokesperson for uh, justifying white uh, uh, rule in India. Uh, Smedley is very clear on it, you know? I mean, there's no uh, uh, hiding the fact. So what I'm saying is what role Mayo was playing, but 
uh, and what uh, so uh, there was no uh, two ways about confronting what mayo was saying but i think uh, in any case there was a larger churning on in indian society thanks more directly to the colonial encounter as a student of history i would say that churning would have happened but maybe in different ways had this long experience of colonial rule not been there but this more than 200 years of british domination in our country it triggered certain forms of expression and assertion of power um, as well as an exposure to other kinds of societies in a more sustained way you know even earlier india from ancient times had uh, exchange of ideas culture trade uh, from ancient times from prehistoric i mean proto historic times definitely we can say from proto historic times but the kind of sustained exposure and interaction which colonial rule enforced on india on unequal terms but it gave us a different kind of exposure and look let us understand the pace of change in industrial societies is much faster much higher than pre industrial societies so uh, what indians are exposed to once industrialization happens in england and capitalism advances in the us that pace of change also forces the pace of change in terms of your own critical reflection about your own social practices prejudices social forms of organization and i think that was what the colonial encounter was about it also triggered a trend which we see till today that you don't want to give up everything that is part of your own history and culture so this tenacity of tradition but the tenacity of tradition as we all see is selective so selective and very anti women practices are held on to as tradition whereas uh, pro women practices are being given up after all there were pro women and uh, more tolerant or diverse practices in our traditions be it amongst uh, religious groups or amongst regions or communities of any order but what we are finding is that anti women practices of all communities have been appropriated by others so dowry is appropriated by others nobody appropriates meher for instance i mean if there was something good why didn't we take that but it is the upper caste practices the uh, anti women traditions which are being selectively projected as our history our tradition our culture and i think that is normal because these traditions and these uh, selective practices serve a purpose to uphold what is seen as the social order by the ruling elites they may be caste based elites they may be class based elites so they see those so patriarchy is part of the ruling class vision it is part of the ruling class ideology it is not alien to that ideology or their needs and they will give it up the day it doesn't suit us it the day doesn't suit us they will give it up i'm telling you and they do give up why do they selectively carry on with certain traditions and practices in the name of heritage culture it is because they serve a purpose they serve a purpose to um, uh, sort of enforce a social order which uh, does not allow for violation of caste norms it does not allow for um challenging those rules which uh, the uh, ruling elites lay down you know after all those norms and rules are laid down by the powerful and they serve their purpose so i think that is where um i think that is where the women's movement and the ideology of the women's movement play a role there is a gen commonality of gender even there when there is a difference in terms of other aspects of social class origins etc but there is a commonality of gender which is which in fact forms a basis for what we call in common parlance the feminist movement and the feminist perspective it is the commonality of the experience of gender based discrimination oppression however 
what i am trying to say is that beyond the commonality of gender there are other forms and other social roots of oppression and exploitation and discrimination when we critique patriarchy and we build a feminist movement which confronts patriarchy it may not necessarily confront all these other aspects of social hierarchies even though as i said attempts have been made over the last several decades to redefine feminism to include all these but i'm saying feminism's equation with power and ruling ideologies may want us to think more critically Yeah. Manjit, are you there? Hello? Hello? Yeah, I'm there. Yeah, yeah. I'm there. Yeah. Well, I don't think we can take up any more questions. The time is up. Uh, where, where is your picture gone? I'm there. Your picture is not there. Oh, on yeah, my now. screen yeah. is yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, we have in fact covered a long range of questions and also the, the, the richness of your lecture had been really great because you have uh, brought in so many documents which many of the many of people may have not even uh, consulted. So the richness of the lecture, I think most of the people who are, who are the uh, uh, women's study students or even historians, it would be of great help to them. And uh, the kind of questions which have really mazed through the feminism, feudalism, colonialism, and and so many and violence. So they are very interesting, and I think it will also keep uh, coming up in the next lectures. So these are these are very question, important uh, questions which came up, and uh, I really thank you on behalf of all the participants that it was really a very good lecture. And many of have in fact actually already put in the chat that uh, they really enjoyed the lecture. Thank you so much. And we will be meeting on 25th again. And yeah, yeah, please. Well, I didn't look at the chat, so I don't know if that record is available either. If you can uh, forward it to me, because I didn't have time while I was speaking to look at the chat, frankly. But what I would say is uh, I'm really uh, happy to get feedback, you know. So if you have questions, um, I, I would request Manjit to share my email ID with all of you. I'd be most happy to get questions, including disagreements, because frankly, they make me think more. They make me think more critically about my own uh, views and uh, points. So you're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the uh, next lecture, as uh, we had said, that it will be on 25th. Once again, I want to really give the information that the last lecture would be on 6th and not 9th, because some of you may have joined later. And kindly keep this in your notebooks that uh, the lecture, last lecture will be on 6th and not 9th. So see you on 25th. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much, Professor Indu Agnihotri. Thank you. Thank you.